Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for attending today's lecture. I am recording this so that I can post it on my YouTube channel. Uh, just an FYI, it will be just a screen share of the presentation, nothing that uh, will show faces. Um, if you aren't comfortable with asking questions via the mic, feel free to put them in the chat and then I can read them out loud. I had some people um, that signed up but they can't attend because of the time change and so they just wanna see the video, which is why I record it so that I can put it on YouTube or if you wanna reference it later. Um, also, I sent out a link to the website that I created for this lecture. It just has some information um, that I use as my sources, so you can check out the websites. It has some information about where you can find me and accessible art history across social media. And um, yeah, lots of good stuff. I'm going to give it just a couple more minutes for people to hop on. But thank you again to everybody that has joined this St. Patrick's Day celebration. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. We might have some people jumping on as we go through. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat for me. Welcome to another Accessible Art History monthly lecture um, this week, or excuse me, this month, because it is St. Patrick's Day today. We are going to discuss the Book of Kells. I realized when I was going through kind of my monthly planner that while St. Patrick's Day is on a Friday, Fridays are my day off from my day job in arts education. And so I thought, why not talk about one of my personal favorite medieval manuscripts and an Irish national treasure. Uh, the Book of Kells is in a beautiful illuminated manuscript and I can't wait to explore it with you all. So just a quick about me before we get started. This is me. Uh, my name is Annalisa Sovereigns Reed and I have a master's in education. I'm an art historian, educator, and the founder of Accessible Art History. So basically, during COVID, I was bored at home because I was isolating for safety, and I decided to expand my little Instagram account um, that I dedicated to creating art history to all about um, creating YouTube videos, podcasts, blogs, curriculum to bring art history to anybody that was curious. Uh, I feel like academia can be very blocked off sometimes, which I still think it's a very important part of the practice. but. You know, there are people like me who maybe uh, graduated during the Great Recession and couldn't afford to go to grad school, but I still love the subject so much. And uh, I eventually did go to grad school and get my master's in education, but I wanted to share my passion with others and connect with others around the world who love history and art as much as I do. And it's kind of turned into this thing where every month I give lectures, I post YouTube videos two to three times a week, I have a podcast, and I just get to share what I love and do what I love with people around the world. All right, so what is the Book of Kells? So as I just mentioned, the Book of Kells is an illuminated manuscript. And uh, it, it was created in the 9th century CE, so in the 800s in Ireland, and it contains the four gospels of the New Testament. Uh, yes, I'd be happy to, uh, sh I just have a question in the chat, friends. I will, um, send out the YouTube channel on Sunday when I this video renders and gets posted, Morgan. I do mostly short form videos just because they're digestible bites. I only started doing these lectures back in December. And so I uh, only have a few longer lecture length ones, but it is my goal to get those up and running, um, you know, as much as time. I do work full time in arts education. So bite-sized videos are a little bit easier, but um, I can totally 
point you in the right direction for some of my longer videos. Um, anyway, the Book of Kells is the four testaments, four gospels of the New uh, Testament. It isn't the entire New Testament. It is just the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it was created by a group of monks as illuminated manuscripts tended to be. I totally recommend if you go to the website that I created for this lecture, Trinity College, where the book is today in Dublin, actually spent a ton of money to scan all 600 pages with a fancy like high resolution camera. And you can actually go on their website that I've linked and look at each page individually, um, really zoomed in, see the brush strokes even. It's a great resource. I wish I was able to like go through all 600 pages, but we'd probably be here till next St. Patrick's Day. Um, but if you have the time, I highly recommend checking it out because I played around with it while doing um, my research just to make sure I had all my facts right for this. And it was really cool to see it um, you know, up close and personal since I'm from the Pacific Northwest. So getting to Dublin to see it in person is a little bit more difficult. So the Book of Kells gets its name from where it was built, the Abbey of Kells. It's in County Meath in Ireland, and this abbey was founded in the 6th century CE by a saint named St. Columba. And he is basically kind of a version of St. Patrick. He brought Christianity to Scotland and Ireland as well in the 6th century. And so according to um, records, he was the one that helped found the Abbey of Kells. He might not have had a direct influence on it like he wasn't there every single day but he definitely helped instruct the people that were building it on where to build it how to build it how we can honor god with this space this picture is the round tower of kells now it's a little bit later it's closer to the time that the book was written between the 8th and 9th century ce um but it's one of the original closer to the original parts that still survives today i mean this was a long time ago so it's kind of exciting that anything survives at all the hill that it was built on was actually once a hill fort um, that was used by Celtic tribes kind of as a defensible position until Christianity came along and they decided to convert it into an abbey. During the 10th century, the abbey was continually raided by Vikings. They made their way from, you know, kind of the Scandinavian coast over to Ireland. And because this was a hill fort, uh, originally, it, you know, it was positioned really well for defense. So the Vikings kind of guessed that maybe there was some gold, some treasure, something good that they could take. So it was raided a lot, but thankfully not all of it was destroyed. In the 12th century, the abbey was dissolved. It just, it wasn't big enough to have that title anymore. And so it became a parish church and it's actually still a parish church today. Um, it is a, the Church of Ireland is, is what it is now. It's not a Catholic church um, per se. And the current building that it's in actually only dates to 1778 while there are some newer buildings that date from the 1960s. But some of the building pieces like this still survive. It's kind of an amalgamation of old and new. And the pieces that are older, like this round tower, uh, are considered national monuments, national treasures. So what is an illuminated manuscript? So we can all guess it's a fancy book, right? Like breaking it down to its barest bones, it's a fancy book. So they're handwritten books because remember, this is before the invention of the printing press. Printing press wasn't invented till around the mid 15th century in Germany. And so this is you know hundreds of years before that. And so if people wanted books or codices as we also call them, they had to be handwritten, hand drawn, and it was a labor of love. And so they're generally decorated because they took so much time with uh, precious materials like gold and silver ink. And they, they didn't use paper. So what they used is something called vellum, and the vellum is dried and stretched animal skin. And it could have been from a variety of animals. Um, most commonly, it was calf, sheep, or goat skin, just because those were the animals that were around uh, monasteries because they often had small farms connected to them to provide the brothers with sustenance. Uh, this image is not from the Book of Kells, but I just like it because it shows a, a guy writing. It's actually St. Matthew from a contemporary gospel that was made in Germany, the Ebo gospel. Highly recommend Googling that. They're kind of weird. Uh, they kind of remind me of like a Picasso or Dali just because they're kind of spooky. Um, we use the word illuminated like the as if you're turning on a light because of the use of gold and uh, rich tones that kind of reflected the candlelight and made it seem, you know, kind of glowy. Like the, the word of God was literally illuminated, literally glowing off the page. Pigment was created by crushing minerals or um, metals like gold 
and then mixing it with some kind of binder. This was typically egg. Egg was used for thousands of years as a binder for pigment until uh, oil was used in the Renaissance. So we see a lot of workshops. We can, there is some archeological evidence that remains of the brothers working uh, in the spaces where they would crush pigments like uh, ochre to create red or the gold and silver powder to create that beautiful shine. And they would be produced in abbeys like at Kells um, in what we call a scriptorium. And it's exactly what it sounds like, you know, writing a script. That's what these rooms are dedicated for. So the brothers would sit on a stool with a table kind of looking like a music stand, um, as in this picture of St. Matthew. And they would write hours and hours and hours a day and draw and, and paint these beautiful images into the books, um, primarily of the Bible. We very rarely see anything else, but it does happen. It just, it's pretty rare because, you know, they're monks, they're studying the word of God. So they're going to write down the word of God. Experts estimate it would have taken about three to five years to um, do the Book of Kells, and that depends on how many people were working on it. There was likely more than one brother working on it, one monk working on it, um, but we, we can't be sure because this was not a time of art for art's sake, right? This was a produced book for worship, for study, and so it didn't matter who the artist was because it was truly God's work. But there, we have books. Um, there's a big one in Paris in the Parisian Library that is 6,000 pages long, and it would have taken them about 20 years to complete. So like I said, this is a labor of love. People dedicated their lives to making these books, and only the wealthy could afford them. Uh, so oftentimes we see them either going to the houses of kings and dukes or staying in the abbey and kind of becoming a center point for worship, which would then bring pilgrims in, and that would be how they would get their money. So before I dive into the actual book of Kells, I think it's important we talk about the insular style that this book is considered. So, you know, we break down art by different styles. We've got the Italian Renaissance, the Northern Renaissance, Gothic, Romanesque, you know, all these different words. When it comes to the book of Kells, we use the word insular. Now insular means insula, which is Latin for island. It's a very, it's a very like to the point name, right? Like sometimes things are a little bit more flowery. No, insula, island insular and that's because ireland is an island i know mind-blowing right like whoever came up with that really thought hard on that one but uh, this is hiberno-saxon art in some older sources um it, they're really interchangeable i prefer insular art just because you see it more commonly used so that's the term i'm going to use and it's a very unique art style and we'll see it later in this lecture as i talk about um the individual pages that i'd like to cover but insular art is unique because Ireland as a whole was relatively untouched by the Roman Empire's expansion. So we know that the island of Great Britain was uh, under the Roman Empire rule. It started with Claudius. We have Londinium as a fort. Hadrian, you know, built his wall all the way up towards the Scottish border. And um, it was really a big Roman city. But because Romans didn't use boats that often, right, they were more land campaigners, they didn't really decide to go into Ireland. And yes, there was a little bit of influence that we see, but honestly, it was untouched. And so we get a very strong, unique, artistic style of the tribes that still lived there. And they were pagan, like the Romans, but they had their kind of their own religious system. And so Roman art that we see in across their empire, not just in the city of Rome, but you know, east and west and north and south from Rome, we kind of see this traditional, very clean mathematical style, but it wasn't really brought over to Ireland because they, they didn't take the time to get on a, the boats and go uh, across the sea. And so Irish society, instead of developing into these large urban centers like uh, Paris, or excuse me, like Rome and, and London, we get these little small communities, these pockets of different tribes, these people that are coming um, and settling together in little groups little individual groups of people, and then saints come along, St. Patrick, St. Columba, and these are, are learned men. They have been exposed to Christianity after it became more popular in the Roman Empire and then legalized under Emperor Constantine in the fourth century, and these men took the, you know, took their brave step into Ireland to bring Christianity to the pagan Celts and up into Scotland as well, which was a little bit 
more akin to Ireland than it was to places like London. And so St. Columba, for example, the founder of the uh, Book of, or excuse me, the Abbey of Kells, he came over from Europe and Britain and he came to Ireland to spread the good word. Besides these new religious ideas, remember like Christianity was illegal for a long time, like for four, 350, yeah, about 350 years after Christ died on the cross. And so it took a while for it to get to Ireland and he brought it and it was like this, whoa, this new idea. But we have these deeply ingrained artistic traditions that combined with these new ideas of Christianity and then an influence of places like Rome and Byzantium that these learned men brought into the new territory. And, and I'm not trying to say the Irish people were not learned. I mean, learned in the sense of like they were more in with the Roman idea, which had really taken over Europe for hundreds of years. But that's not saying the Irish were, were unlearned or, or dumb or anything at all. They were just not in the tradition, the Western tradition that we're familiar with. And so these new religious ideas combined with these Celtic, Irish, Anglo traditions, and it really formed to create this new artistic style that's, you know, fairly unique across the history of art. Like we see little tiny bits of it floating into Great Britain. We see it in Germany a little bit as well. Um, but honestly, it, it's pretty unique to Ireland. And I find that fascinating because today we live in such a global society where you know, we have social media and we have 24 hour news cycles where everything is so interconnected. And, and so it's hard for, for me personally to imagine like this island's just creating this beautiful new art style that is truly and uniquely its own. And so we also call this um, the age of saints and scholars. So around 400 to 1000 CE, this is just an image of St. Columba from uh, Wikipedia, because obviously there are no real images of him from so long ago that survive. And as you can see, he's bringing religion to the uh, Irish people, and he's got his already converted monks with him. And again, it's just such a unique style because Christianity was allowed to develop kind of almost in its own little bubble in Ireland because travel and communication was so difficult back then. So here are the character, excuse me, characteristics of insular art. And I think this Cairo page really breaks it down for us in you know, one digestible chunk. So quick thing of the Cairo monograms um, are very common in Christianity across you know, all of Europe and the Middle East at the time because they're almost a secret symbol, right? Christianity was illegal. You couldn't really let people know that you were Christian and so you had to you know, signal them. And Cairo are the first two letters of Christ in Greek. So it became this like, you know, this little code. So if you had the Cairo like near your house, people were like, oh, okay, that's safe. That's a Christian house, I can go there. And so the first and most prevalent part of insular art that we see across all of the art from here are those intricate knots. And so you can see them here, you can see them here, little dots and patterns and swirls everywhere there's different knots and they're just I don't know I just think they're so cool because think of having to do this all by hand each little piece you had to draw and interconnect and we see them not only on uh aluminum manuscripts but there's a lot of stone crosses that have these knots on here but they vary so much like this one is super complicated but this one is very simple and so it was really a unique personal style that developed, you know, what monks were good at drawing what kind of knots and how can they collaborate to make this truly dynamic swirling image. Um, we do see a lot of highlighting in darker jewel tones, but these pieces here would have been painted in uh, gold that shone brilliantly. Like you have to remember this thing is like over a thousand years old. So it's going to be dull uh, by time, but imagine it like freshly painted, drying on, a drying rack and just how shiny and brilliant it would have been. We also see a lot of like weird faces. Like this guy, I don't know if he's like a beheaded man or he's like part snake. I don't know what's really going on. I don't think anybody does. But his little head pops out of the swirl. There's some people here who are kind of like angelic figures. They're 
they're chilling over on the uh, left side. And so we see this combination of kind of a spiritual swirling with that fantastical element. And some art historians, you know, think it's part of that paganism that stuck around, right? You can only grow and, and change so quickly. And so by sticking in these kind of strange mythological creatures, it was that throwback to the more pagan past of, uh, of Ireland. And so we also see, and it's a little hard on these images just because they are so old, uh, rich jewel tones. Now, Irish loved a jewel tone and I get it. I love a jewel tone too, but this was actually influenced heavily by Byzantium. And so at this time, uh, the Roman Empire had really been fragmented. We know that the Goths overtook it in the fifth century and the center really became Constantinople, which is now Istanbul and Turkey. And Byzantine art is really heavily influenced by jewel tones. We see rich purples, dark reds, dark blues, and dark greens show up all the time. And a lot of these Christian missionaries, not just the famous ones like St. Patrick and St. Columba, um, but you know, regular people who just decided to travel and spread God's word, they came over from Constantinople via Rome because that was the center of learning, that was the center of the religion. And so they brought with them these ideas of artistic style and passed them down through teaching. So even though Christianity had been in Ireland for about 300 years at this point, we have that artistic tradition from the East that is still being passed down to the different monks that are working in the scriptorium. So now I think that we should go through some of my personal favorite pages. I picked out three today. Remember at the beginning, I said that there was about 600 pages that Trinity College has scanned um, onto an online database. These are the ones that I think A, are just really cool and fun to talk about, and B, uh, have the best resolution and have the best preserve so that we can really dive into those specific details. So this is the one I used as the cover. This is called Christ Enthroned. And so um, as you can guess, this man in the center, he is Christ. <laughs> he has a book which we can assume is his gospel, is the gospel of the New Testament, um, kind of propped up holding it. You can't see his uh, other hand, but I can assume he's like holding the book up with it. And then this hand gesture he's making is actually the symbol of blessing that priests, bishops, you know, religious figures would make on the congregation to kind of bless the entire group as a whole. He is wearing um, rich robes. You can see it would have been once a really dark red. And if you look at the bottom, you can really get a good sense of we have those swirls, those Celtic knots, those insular style uh, decorations on the robe. And it's this beautiful dark blue. There's even trying to do a sense of three dimensionality here, which is mind blowing because this really wasn't a thing in Western Europe. Excuse me, I'll take a sip of water. This wasn't really a thing in Western Europe yet of showing, trying to show three dimensionality, but the monk who painted this, unfortunately, you know, whose name has been lost to history, has outlined almost like a step stool in blue and propped Christ's feet up on it. So we can kind of get the illusion that he is both enthroned, but he's also propping his own feet up. And we can also get a sense of the three dimensionality with this little uh, chair behind him. And as we can see, Christ is the biggest figure. It's fascinating to me. This is a very universal concept in art history. It's, we see it with the ancient Sumerians. We see it in Ireland, you know, thousands of years later in ancient Egypt, we see it. And it's called a hierarchy of scale. And basically the bigger a figure is in the work, the more important they are, you know, head honcho is the big guy. And so Christ as Christ is the most important figure. On the side of him, we have these two stylized peacocks. I think their faces, it's kind of hard to see on this because I can only make it so big. But if you go on the website, you can zoom it in. They're like really sassy looking and I just love that they have a personality. And peacocks in um, ancient Christianity are actually symbols of the resurrection. It's not a phoenix, it's the peacock. And so this is alluding to the fact that Christ you know, died on the cross and three days later, he was resurrected. I find it so interesting that Christ is blonde here. Um, I don't know if this is just because we tend to see lighter, fair skin the farther north you go um, in our globe. And so maybe the uh, Irish monks just, you know, thought, well, Christ must be blonde because we're all blonde. But it's an interesting detail because usually in art, we see him as a brunette across um, 
you know, pretty much all of art history, we see him as a brunette. So we've got blonde Christ, he has a thick beard, but look, his curls aren't really curls. They're those same intricate knots on either side of his head. And so I think it's just amazing that they still continue to try and find ways to insert their own um, style into this image. These guys down here are uh, angels. So again, alluding to the fact that we are in heaven and making sure that we know that Christ is enthroned in heaven. Like he has already been resurrected because we have the peacocks and the angels. Uh, again, we see the intricate knots on either side of this border. And then we've got these little pages. I just think it's so fascinating. Like how long did it take for them to paint these and come up with the designs and draw them out? We can even see they doodled in the corner, maybe trying to uh, come up with a design. We call this marginalia. Uh, there's whole works of, you know, books and, and paintings on marginalia, like they drew some weird stuff or wrote notes to each other and just like didn't scrape them off. This is really common imagery um, throughout all illuminated manuscripts, like no matter where it was made, Ireland all the way to Germany, all the way to Italy, like marginalia is everywhere. This next one is a bit darker. This page is a bit older, um, not older like as in the uh, page, but the, the scan of it is a bit older. So I apologize, this is the, the best quality one that I could find. This one is called The Four Evangelists. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, the uh, Book of Kells is not the entire New Testament. It's just the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this, this wasn't uncommon, you know, like I said, these things take a long time to make. So if you pick out kind of the meaty ones, the ones with Christ's story, and separate them from the, the Pauline books where St. Paul wrote those letters to the different Christian communities, it was easier to, to both afford to make them and then finish them on a reasonable timetable because you were only dealing with certain chunks of the Bible. And in Christianity, things were originally made with secret symbols, right? Like I said earlier, that with the Cairo symbol, people had to signal that they were Christians without, you know, signaling that they were Christians because they risked persecution. Like, for example, during the reigns of Diocletian, the Roman emperor, he executed tons of Christians or even all the way back at the beginning with Emperor Nero, he blamed the great fire of Rome on St. Peter and his followers and had them, you know, crucified upside down on the Vatican Hill. And so Christianity, they were big on symbols to protect themselves. And each of the four evangelists were given their own symbol. So this guy up in the corner here, this winged man, he's sometimes referred to as an angel, but um, it's more common that he's just a man with wings to separate the fact that he is one of the gospel writers. That is St. Matthew. And next to him, we see a winged lion. It's kind of scary. You know, he's rearing up and going in for the kill, but you know, he's also holy because he's got this cool halo. And that is St. Mark, if you ever have the chance, you know, sidebar here, if you ever have a chance to go to Venice, beautiful city, and there's those beautiful lions on the outside of the basilica, that's because St. Mark is represented by the lion and he is the patron saint of Venice. Down here, it's, it's kind of hard to tell because, you know, like I said, insular art is its own little thing. This is a flying ox. You can kind of see his sideways. And so here's his legs and then here's his little horns and his head, and that is St. Luke. And down here, very majestic, we have St. John as the eagle. Again, these are heavily stylized, right? Like, if, it's kind of hard to tell that he's an ox. He's blue, he's got wings. You know, this lion has like three strands of a mane, and he also has wings, and the tail looks like a lion. So it's pretty hard to tell because if you're thinking about looking at the actual animal itself, they don't look alike, but then you put on this lens, of insular art and I'm like oh this is more of a mythological thing right they're connecting their mythological past with these new images adding in jewel tones adding in the swirls and then we get that unique style of insular art that it's just Irish art really like it's just so unique to to this one region of the world and that's why I think it's you know it's the perfect thing for St. Patrick's Day it's a very Irish holiday and it's a very important art style with insular art. We have a very cohesive design on this one um, with a color palette. We see the reds and the blues are picked up in the borders. You know, each one has a golden background, which then pulls into the golden background on the side. We can even see some text. Uh, obviously, we can't read it now, but this would have been text right here, perhaps explaining that this is the book of the four gospels. 
Um, or, you know, maybe somebody scraped off the text that was pretty common. You didn't have erasers for ink on vellum. So you would use a really sharp knife and kind of slide it across the page to pull up that top layer. And then you still had a fairly solid piece of vellum to then paint on. All right. And finally, this is a virgin and child enthroned. Um, this is a really common image in medieval art, not just insular art. We see a lot of pictures of the Madonna and child um, in different styles. And I picked this one because A, you can see it really well, so it's nice to talk about, but B, it's just so interesting that we see these developments that didn't come from much later in art history developing in Ireland. So like I talked about with Christ and Throne, we do try and get a sense of three-dimensionality. And so her, it's a very interesting throne. It's kind of curved and her whole body sinks into it. But we have Christ painted very clearly in front of her. And then down here, we have um, some men, perhaps they're holy figures. They're, they're not really identified. Uh, they don't really have halos, so we're not sure. But like the angels are clearly angels and they don't have halos. So it, it, we're not really sure. But look, they're stacked. You know, three behind, three in front, and we can clearly see that giving an illusion of depth in a two-dimensional work. The red robe with the purple skirt of the Virgin Mary, along with this very heavy halo with kind of purpley red details, very Byzantine. So this is kind of where we see the influence of Constantinople come in um, with these this rich color palette, but we still have, you know, those beautiful greens and golds of insular art. So again, even though it's this unique style developing, there are still influence coming in to help develop that style. I think that this also goes with the concept of like medieval babies are kind of ugly, like no offense to Christ, but he kind of reminds me of um, Pinocchio because he looks like a puppet with uh, this line across his face. Uh, but again, we see kind of the swirling hair. The angels are, one is facing us, which is very unusual in art at this point. Like usually the viewer is excluded from any interaction in the work, right? We're meant to view the work. The work is not meant to view us or include us. But this angel is staring straight out at the viewer like, hey, do you see what's going on here? This is a holy scene. We've got the virgin and we've got the child sitting in the thrones of heaven, like pay attention. And then this angel right here is focusing downward as if to you know, escort them, to guard them, to show that we are in heaven. We've got another guy peeking out here. Some people have attributed this to being um, Joseph, uh, Mary's husband and Christ's earthly father, but it's kind of hard to tell. It could also be St. Columba because this is a, a staff um, and saints are used, usually shown with a staff like the missionary ones because they're walking through the forest or through the land to try and come and, and spread their gospels. And again, you know, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but look at these knots. That's a very Celtic style, very insular style, combined with this illusion of three-dimensionality of kind of giving the pages corners. It's it's so fascinating that we have this idea of three-dimensionality developing in the ninth century when it really didn't develop until the 13th and 14th centuries in Italy, where it, it you know it's very famous. So where is the Book of Chalcedon. I mentioned it a few times. It is at the Trinity College in the old library in Dublin. But how did it get there? So in the 9th and 10th centuries, we see a lot of Viking raids in Ireland. Uh, thankfully, some records survive. And they did seem to like break into the church and take the Book of Kells because it had a shiny like bejeweled cover, right? You worked all this time. You want the book to look good on the outside as well as the inside. So they were often encased in a cover that had like jewels set into it. And so the Vikings seem to have taken it. And then like 50 years later, they dropped it back off. They just ripped the cover off. And I like to think that there was some like Viking raid captain that was wondering why he had this book in his thing. And was like, eh, whatever, like, let's just take it back. And they brought it back and it was there ever since. It, it's a miracle that it survived because you know, more often than not, when these jeweled covers were taken off, they would rip them off and then, you know, discard of the book somewhere. The, and vellum is, is just uh, calf or goat or sheepskin, and it would deteriorate really quickly if left out to the elements. And so having this, this book survive is just, you know, an absolute miracle. We know that it was in the Abbey in the 11th century because a traveler 
um, and writer named Gerald of Wales saw it and he wrote the most beautiful quote about it and I'd like to read it to you. It says, this book contains the harmony of the four evangelists according to Jerome. Um, Jerome was the saint that translated the uh, first time the gospel into Latin. So that's why uh, he mentions him. Wherefore, almost every page there are different designs and other forms almost infinite. Fine craftsmanship is all about you, but you might not notice it. Look more keenly at it and you will penetrate to the very shrine of art. You'll make out the intricacies so delicate and subtle, so exact and compact, so full of knots and lace, the colors so fresh and vivid that you might say that this was all the work of an angel and not of a man. And I just find that so fascinating because it's almost as if time collapses when we look at this quote, right? When we look at these beautiful pieces of art, we see those intricate knots, those beautiful vivid colors that Gerald is talking about. And yet he lived in the 12th century and here we are in the 21st century. Yes, our version is a little more faded because you know time happens, but we can see what he's talking about. And it's almost as if we are standing next to Gerard of Wales and looking at this book together. And I just, that's one thing I love about art history is when you're looking at a work of art, time almost doesn't exist. It's, you know, you're looking at it and so was someone in the 12th century. And I, I just love that because it, it connects humanity. You know, we're not, we're not so different from each other. Now in 1654, Oliver Cromwell's troops came through Ireland and were pillaging and stealing because, you know, they wanted to take over the entire, you know, British Isles. And so the monks at Kells, the, or the people of Kells, I guess just to say, since it wasn't a monastery anymore, they brought it to Dublin, to the big city, because there were more resources to fight it and keep it safe. Um, and eventually, you know, they just ended up keeping it there because the abbey was just a small parish church. They weren't equipped to handle such a delicate manuscript. And so a man named Henry Jones, who was the Bishop of Clower and the Vice Chancellor of the University of Dublin, decided that, you know, the best place that it could be was at the Trinity College in Dublin. And so this happened about 10 years after Cromwell's troops came in. It's still there to this day in the old library. You can actually go visit it. I would love to. I've never been to Dublin, but if I ever get a chance to go, I definitely am going to uh, go explore. It's a beautiful old library from all the pictures that I can see. You know, like this Beauty and the Beast style ladder is uh, so cool. Um, and they have displays that rarely leave. Sometimes pages will be given to, um, you know, exhibits around the world as like a courtesy, but really the majority of the book is in Ireland. Still to this day where it's an Irish treasure. Are there any questions about the Book of Kells? Anything else we want to examine? Um, I know we're a little soon. It was a shorter lecture today just because there's only so many pages that I can go through. Are there any other, say, super famous illuminated manuscripts either in Ireland or just elsewhere that you would say we should look up if we're just kind of looking at this and saying, wow, this is so beautiful. I want to see more. Would you say, yeah, absolutely. You look up what you do with this one or, or do you have any favorites, I guess? Uh, yeah, great question, Morgan. Thank you. Um, so I love the Lindisfarne Gospels, L-I-N-D-I-S-F-A-R-N-E. Um, they are also a uh, British Isles gospel, I believe. It's been a while since I've looked it up, but they're very similar to the... Um, the Book of Kells in that kind of swirly jewel tone style. That's a beautiful one. The Ebo Gospels, which is where um, St. Matthew was from. I love this gospel. It's in what we call the Carolingian style. So Charlemagne, um, you may have heard of him, first Holy Roman Empire. Uh, his family commissioned it, like his line is, I believe it was Otto II, but I, I could be wrong about that. It's been a while since I've, I've looked at it also. Um, and it's this very like, linear kind of almost spooky like he St. Matthew looks pretty stressed here and I it's just such a unique that Carolingian period is a very like brief snapshot in art history but it was super unique and actually influenced a lot of later artists um so I definitely check that out and um also there's the Paris Psalter it's P-S-A-L-T-R and it um it has some really cool illuminations as well and if you're looking for a later illuminated manuscript, 
Um, there's one called the rich hours of the duke of berry um i wasn't going to try and pronounce its french name because i would just uh, bash it it's in the collection of the met cloisters most of it in new york city and it was done in the mid 15th century and so if you want to see kind of a compare and contrast i'd really check that one out because it's almost on the cusp of the renaissance so it's really interesting to see how those styles developed but those are my top ones Thank you. That's awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. And let's see. Um, BJ wants to know about the page with the Virgin. So let's go find her. Oops, wrong way. Find her again. Sorry, I had to change. I changed the PowerPoint like partway through when I was doing my research. So I forgot she's down here. All right. Are you talking about this one down here? I'm assuming so. Um, that person looks to me like another angel just because we have wings here. These could be incense burners. Um, they look kind of weird, but um, they're probably incense burners. And with these wings that are, you know, they've got the pink feathers on top, like the other two angels, I would say that's an angel. Thanks. Yes, of course. I'm so glad I've got a lot of comments. Everybody enjoyed this. I'm so excited because like the Book of Kells, illuminated manuscripts aren't as popular, you know, as like Leonardo da Vinci. And so it's it's really exciting that uh, we're, I was able to introduce some people to it and we enjoyed it. Uh, Hillary wants to know, does the attempt at 3D depiction spread into other art forms like stone carvings at this date? Great question, Hillary. Um, I don't have any pictures of the stone carvings really except for, um, the beginning of the presentation with the Book of Kells. So this guy right here, and yes, we can actually see it here. We've got, it looks like a depiction of the crucifixion on this cross. Uh, we do see it, the Celtic knots were actually carved into um, stone as well. We see a lot of Celtic crosses and th that went all the way up through Irish history, right? It was a very common Irish um, motif. And so this attempt at three dimensionality really was doing what we call a raised relief. So the stone was carved out in such a way that the image or the symbol or you know whatever they wanted on the cross would be uh, carved around. And so that the stone was taken away so that the image kind of looked three-dimensional. So yes, we do see that. All right. And Roger, it looks like you raised your hand. Do you, do you have a question still? Yes, please. I of course don't know. Whether, I I don't know whether I misheard, but did you say that uh, some pages from the Book of Kells had been presented to visiting dignitaries from around the world? Um. Yes. So they they have been presented. Um, but not on a permanent basis. And so the the library has allowed um them to go to small exhibits. Um, I think there was one at the Louvre, and this is, you know, far before I was in art history, so I'm not entirely sure when it was. Um, but they're always given back because it oh. is considered like by the, the Irish government um, to be a national treasure. Okay. And so it, it's a lot of negotiating to get them to uh, to share them, but they have made them super accessible around the world with those high resolution scans. And they swap out the pages um, on a regular basis in the exhibit to a give people new ones to look at and be you know kind of keep them out of the light on a continuous basis. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Roger. All right, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, if you think of something, if you're reviewing this um, later, and you think of something. My email is uh, on the website, and then I also uh, can send you saw it with my Eventbrite update with the Zoom link. So if you think of something else later, or there's a specific topic that you want me to chat about, please drop me a line. Like I'm a, I'm a big lover of art history and love to nerd out with people about it. So feel free to, to ask any questions later if they pop up via email. And keep an eye out. I haven't decided on April's topic yet. If there's something that you're interested in, Again, shoot me an email. Um, I'd be happy to cover it in my next lecture. And um, I look forward to uh, seeing you all next month. Have a great rest of your day.